Take your Bible, if you would, and open it to Acts, the third chapter. Put your marker there, because that'll be where the bulk of our lesson will come from this morning. I say the bulk, I will venture to a few other places, but that'll be the thrust of our lesson as we'll be studying in Acts, the third chapter today. It's good to be here this morning. Appreciate the presence of all. It has been noted we've got some visiting with us. We're certainly glad you are here and appreciate all of our regulars who are with us as we continue to try to adjust to the very different situation that we have. And let me just say before I go into the sermon, I did a lot of careful research and that is exactly what Peter looked like up there, you know, it, uh, no, it, um, you know, that picture largely is there to break up the solid black background. Um, as we've gone to live streaming, I don't know if any of you've noticed this, but every slide now always has a black background and white letters because the tech guys told me black background and white letters. And I have learned, do what the tech guys tell you or they will mess with you up here, you know. Um, you know, some, sometimes they do it even without me doing anything to them. But anyway, no, that's why and I sometimes try to put a little picture up there just to give it a little color. Imagine the scene there in Acts, the third chapter. And we talked about this a little bit last week. But, you know, here are Peter and John. They're going up into the temple. And the temple in the first century was composed of several sections, as it were, courtyards. There was a large, expansive court known as the Court of the Gentiles. And then you went up a few steps, and there was the Court of the Women. You know, past the Court of the Gentiles, no Gentile could go. But into the Court of the Women, any Israelite could go, including the women. And then from the court of the women, you went up a few more steps and there was the court of the Israelites where the male Israelite could go. And then another series of steps into the court of the priest where the temple itself stood, which if you're following meant it was raised up high in elevation. But the scene takes place at a gate called Beautiful that was between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women. And there was a beggar there, a man that had been laid there for days, I mean, mean, on a daily basis for a great period of time. And Peter and John encountered this man. And Peter takes him by the hand in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. This man not only can walk, He is leaping about. He's shouting praises to God. It is quite the scene. And it draws together this crowd. And we notice in verse 11, they ran together at a place called, in the porch, which is called Solomon's. Solomon's porch, or some of your translations say portico, was this large covered colonnade. It ran along the, I believe it was the east side of the wall, and thousands of people could fit underneath this. And it brings them together, and Peter preaches to them. And I want you to begin with me at verse 12, and we're going to read down through the fourth verse of the fourth chapter. So I would encourage you to follow along, or if you prefer, listen very carefully. So when Peter saw it, that is, he saw this crowd gather to him, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. 
Yet, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Even though the chapter breaks it up, I'm calling this the interrupted sermon because you know they're preaching away and challenging the people to listen to God and all of a sudden they are arrested mid-sermon. What's the sermon? Let me just give you the quick summary. In this sermon, as we noted last week, Peter quickly tries to turn their attention away from him and John. You know, why are you looking at us as though you know, by our own power, our godliness, we made this man whole? He says, look at God and look at the God whom he says, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is speaking here to a Jewish audience and he wants to tie together what has just happened with this beggar to the God that had made the promises to Abraham that made this covenant with Abraham who had spoken to Moses. Verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made. And just like he did in the second chapter, he said, you killed the Christ. You are responsible for the death of Jesus. But God raised him up. There is one great difference, and we'll talk a little more about this in a few moments. But he says in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance. There is a, a little bit of a, almost a softening here. He's laying it out to them. You killed the Christ. Pilate wanted to let him go. But no, you insisted. He has to be killed. And he said, but you acted in ignorance. He says, now here's what you've got to do. You've got to repent and be converted. And the last part of the sermon is just largely an admonition of listen to Jesus. As we talked last week, he is the prophet. If you don't hear the prophet, you'll be destroyed. So he says, listen to Jesus. Do what he tells you. Now, that's the basic sermon. And I would encourage you to go back and read it again. What I'd like to do is pull out a few points I think of great emphasis. One, and this is the book of Acts, not Acts 3. The resurrection of Jesus matters. Sometimes we get into the book of Acts and we end up, and we must, let me just say this, we must give attention to some of the controversial issues. Issues like 
the necessity of baptism. You know, who is the collection being made for? You know, the work of the Holy Spirit. And we need to give attention to these, how we say, controversial, divisive issues. But not at the expense of missing a key point in Acts. It's not just that Jesus died for our sins, but that he was raised. He didn't stay dead. Look at a few passages. And I'm going to go through these quickly, but I want you to see the point of emphasis. In Acts 1, in verse 21, they're replacing Judas. Well, who are they going to get to replace him? Well, it's somebody that can be, verse 22, a witness with us of his resurrection. It couldn't just be anybody. It had to be somebody that could be a witness of the resurrection. In the second chapter, the famous Sermon on Pentecost, you crucified the Christ, verses 22 through 24. But God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Verse 30, David, as a prophet, saw that he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Chapter 3, you denied the, verse 14, you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. I've got other passages listed. I'm not going to read at this point. But throughout the sermons, when he preaches to Cornelius the Gentile, and we're going to be looking at that one a little later on, he raised up Jesus from the dead. In Acts 13, in the synagogue at Antioch, the synagogue at Antioch, he gives great emphasis that he raised him up. The second psalm, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. He applies to the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts 17, when he preaches to the Gentiles in Athens, he talks about the resurrection. To Agrippa, you know, he asked him a question, you know, you know, you believe in the prophets. Why do you think it amazing that God would raise someone from the dead? Why is this so important? Why do they keep saying he was raised from the dead? Because the resurrection is the great proof of his deity. You know, we say Jesus proved who he was by all the miracles he did. The miracles do help establish his claims. But we can see prophets like Elijah and Moses who worked some miracles similar to Jesus. But Jesus in Matthew 12, when they were asking for another sign, chapter, verses 38 through 40, he said, you're not going to get another sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Jonah came forth. He said, I'll come forth. Romans 1 declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. How do we know who Jesus is? Because he said, I'll be raised. And he was raised. Look at Acts 26. There's a second part of this, though. It's not just that it established Jesus as the Son of God. It set forth what's going to happen to us. Acts 26 and verse 23. The Christ would suffer. This is when he's speaking to Agrippa. That he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. To say that he would be the first gives the very strong implication he won't be the last. In Acts the 17th chapter, when he was speaking to those at Athens, 
It says he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. There's going to be a judgment, he says. How do we know this? He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. When you die, he says God can raise you. He raised Jesus up. That's testimony that everybody will stand before him. That you're not going to escape in that. 1 Corinthians 15 repeatedly says he is the first fruits that we're going to come forth. That this body will corrupt, but this body will be raised incorruptible. So when we think of Jesus and his resurrection, it's a, let me say, I guess it's a, it's a positive and it's a negative. It gives us hope of a glorious body, a body that's not afflicted by the pains and the sufferings and the death that we see now. But it's also the assurance that we're going to be raised to face him in judgment, prepared or unprepared. But he's also that sympathetic high priest. Eric spoke of this a little in the Lord's Supper talk. Jesus was not just the atoning sacrifice. He rose from the grave. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That our high priest will not go up on the mountain and never come back down again like Aaron did. That won't happen. Our priest has entered into heaven where he will always be there. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and we find that grace and mercy to help in time of need, Hebrews 4, because the tomb was found empty. The resurrection of Jesus is important. But I want to go back to something I I said earlier. If you've never read Acts, the third chapter, and I'm sure everyone here has, but if you're reading it for the first time, or even if it's been a little while since you read it, I think verse 17 comes across a little bit surprising. I mean, he he has, as we might say, he is laying them out. He is really telling them about their faults. Pilate wanted to let him go. You wouldn't allow it. And then all of a sudden, there's a little bit more of a conciliatory tone. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Why this change? I think there may be a couple of factors working here. One is it allows him to segue to the emphasis on the plan of God. That definite plan of God, the determined counsel and foreknowledge, he put it in the second chapter. As he'll later develop This is what the prophets from Samuel onward have been talking about. They've been speaking of these days. You killed Jesus, but it was always in God's plan that he would die. I think that's part of it. But I believe there is also this. That when we are talking to people, when we are trying to persuade people, I know it can be a fine line, but we've got to speak the truth without compromise. We've got to speak the truth in a way the Holy Spirit came revealing this truth to convict the world of sin. We've got to speak it in such a way that it produces that godly sorrow and that guilt. And yet... It's not to be done in such a way as simply to make people angry, to, you know, drive people away or make them feel backed into the corner. There's a 
To me, it, it sounds a note of empathy when he says that. And that's a good thing. That's something to strive for. Verse 15 I want to back up to something here. He says, You killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. There's a part of this that I've talked about before, and I'm going to mention it again, because I don't want us to forget it. But apostles were witnesses of the resurrection. They were not, people today say, giving their witness you know as as some you know a subjective testimony of how they feel God has worked in their lives you know they were people who ate and drank with him they knew what they had seen meaning if somebody says they're an apostle today I mean I guess you can take that name if you want to but you're not an apostle after the New Testament pattern That There's no one like that. But what I really want to emphasize is the solid foundation of our faith. Faith, I understand. Hebrews 11, 1. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith requires the ability to believe in and trust in that which I can't put my hands on. That I can't see maybe with my physical eyes but faith does not mean some kind of leap in the dark that it, it's it has no oh you just got to take it by faith well there's well why well just take it by faith you know I, the last few weeks some of you may have noticed i'm trying to squint at that screen because i would forget to bring in my glasses and they had taken away my monitor the men who've stood up here know there, there's always been a little monitor hidden up here. They took it away from me for a couple of weeks. And my eyes weren't good enough to see back there. But I had confidence. I had faith that I was going to be able to see this monitor today. Why? Well, Adam had told me he was going to have my slides up there. Now, I didn't get up here beforehand and do a test run. But I had confidence in him. I had reason to believe. Well, when it comes to faith, I have reason to believe. Acts 14 and verse 17 says, here he is speaking to an idolatrous people at Lystra. And he talked about how that God in the past had let the nations go in their own ways. But he makes the point, verse 14, Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He said the the things of nature were bearing testimony. They were saying there is a God. Romans 1 and verse 20, For since the creation of the world, The invisible things of God are clearly seen. (laughs) Invisible is clearly seen by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. You just look at nature. It, It gives you reason to believe that all of this couldn't have just happened by chance. But coming back to what we said about the apostles, They bore witness. They said, we saw this man. I want you to look at Acts 10. This is one of the texts I had up earlier. I said, I'm not going to read it this time. But when he's at the house of Cornelius, Peter speaks of Jesus and said, and we are witnesses, verse 39, of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to those, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. 
I'm amazed sometimes that people read verse 41. He didn't appear to everybody but to witnesses chosen before by God. And they'll say, see, the fix was in. No. He appeared to people who were able to say, oh, yeah, this is Jesus. They had spent the better part of three years with him. And he sat down with them. He ate and he drank. Remember, these men, they had their doubts. Uh, we're seeing a spirit. Luke 24, he said, give me something to eat. And he ate with them. He would say, feel my hands, my feet, Thomas. You won't keep doubting. You'll know. These men, these apostles we're talking about as witnesses, they suffered. Most of them, it is believed, lost their lives for their testimony. Folks, they were in a position to know. Peter and John went and looked inside that empty tomb. I have to, on faith, decide whether or not I want to accept their testimony or not. Everything I read about these men is credible. They had no reason to tell this yarn. It didn't make them famous. You know, I mean, they're famous to us today. But in the first century, Paul would describe himself and the other apostles. He said, we've been made like the off-scouring of the world. That's the gook you scrape off a dirty plate. He said, that's the way we're viewed. They knew, though. And therefore, I can know. He said, we have these witnesses. The evidence of God. The men in the position to testify. Now coming back to Acts 3, he says, here's what you need to do then. You need to repent. That's the same thing he'd said in the second chapter. When they said in verse 37, what shall we do? The first word out of his mouth was repent. Jesus is Savior for those who are willing to renounce their sins. Willing to turn away from them. I want to take you back to something the same writer had said much earlier. In Luke the third chapter, Luke says repentance is practical. That is, it has effect, effects on our lives. Verse 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now who's talking here? This is John the Baptist. And his message largely was repent. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, but we need fruits worthy of repentance. You can't just say, well, we're children of Abraham. He speaks of coming judgment in verse 9. And then verse 10, the people ask him saying, well, what shall we do then? You're saying bear fruits worthy of repentance. What do you mean by that? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. If we are going to come to Jesus, if we're going to remain with Jesus, it requires the renouncing of sin. It, it requires the changing of our lives. But there in Acts, the third chapter, I want to take note of something in verse 26 that is... I think maybe overlooked, I've overlooked it many times. Verse 19 is the commandment to the people. Verse 26, he says, To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Why did God send Jesus? You know, that's one of those that 
if it were in school and it were a test, you could write an essay on it. You know, there are, there are multiple answers to this, multiple parts of it. But he said, he sent Jesus to bless you. Well, how do you get the blessing? Because he sent him to turn you away from your iniquities. The more I look at it, the more I realize. In verse 19, he's saying, you are responsible for repentance. Verse 26, he says, Christ is producing this repentance in you. No, not, not some miraculous against your will. It's still my choice, verse 19, as to whether I'll repent. But we are turned how? Well, by the love of the cross. The idea of one who would give his life freely for me. The fact that he would promise me that my sins, as numerous as they are, they can be forgiven if I will turn away from my sins. That turns me away. The threats he makes, and they're not idle threats. I mean, we've all been in Walmart and watched that mother who didn't know how to count to three. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you the three. One, two. Now, I'm, now, you better straighten up before I, I count to three. You know, you think God's like that? No. I turn, you know, one of the things that turns me away from iniquity are the threats he holds over my head. The promises he holds out before me. That love that was seen at the cross. If I'm having trouble, if you're having trouble with some sin in your life that you just can't seem to shake it, maybe you're not thinking enough about the cross. You're not thinking enough about the promises of God. You're not taking seriously enough His threats. He's striving to turn you away. We must allow Him to do so. Then there's this, finally. Be converted. I want you to compare. In many of you, in your Bibles, you can, some of them may be on the same opening in mine. It's back one page. Day of Pentecost. What shall we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's very simple to understand, isn't it? There's two instructions given. Repent, be baptized, resulting in remission of sins. In the third chapter, verse 19, the first and the third are clearly the same. Repent, and then the sins are blotted out. But in the middle, instead of saying be baptized, he says be converted. Or if you're reading English Standard, it'll say turn again. Repent and turn again. New American Standard. Repent and return. Is he telling this group something different than what he told the group on Pentecost? I think not at all. Now, you know, men contradict themselves frequently. We're talking men guided by the Holy Spirit who were guided by the Spirit of truth. I'm not saying the two words or expressions are exactly synonymous, but they're not different either. New Testament baptism, you know, I've talked about it before in the light of it's not infant baptism because Matthew 28, you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. It's for people who hear the gospel, Mark 16, who believe and are baptized. Acts 2, 38, it is for those who repent, who felt that conviction of sin and would turn from sin. Well here, what he tells me is that baptism is a part, is really an act of turning to God. 
It's, it's, it's that returning to God. You repent and be baptized. You repent and turn. You know, you can take somebody. You know, we were kids. We swam in the creeks a lot, you know. I'm, only rich people had a pool, you know. But, uh, you know, we, you went to the creek where people always lied to you and said, oh, it's, it's not cold today. <laughs> there was never a day it wasn't cold. But I'll tell you something about those creeks. We baptized a lot of folks in those creeks. And that is, we took people and we shoved them under the water. You know, we, and I, I, I got baptized a bunch of times in the sense of, I got put under water. But we were playing around. We weren't turning to God. Baptism of the New Testament is that of, as Romans 6, 17 says, it's obeying from the heart. It's being baptized into the death of Christ. It's Galatians 3, 26, 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When I look at that expression, be converted, or return, or turn again, depending on your translation. What it is to me is one more emphasis that when we are baptized, it's not a matter of, okay, I'll, I'll go under the water. You know, somebody wants me to do this, I'll do this. Or even knowing that God wants me to go under the water. It is an act of turning to God. Somebody says returning. How's that? The one who gave you life. He wants you to come back to him. I think in a sense, while repentance is one of those words that in some context, it encompasses both the negative and the positive. Here, here, it's probably intended to be more than negative. As in, get rid of. Eliminate sin. Turn then on the positive side to God. Baptism is the positive act of putting on Christ. Of making a commitment that from this day forward, I will wear Him. I will seek to be in His image. No, there will be the stumbles along the way. But that's our goal. Look at verse 19. That your sins may be blotted out. You don't want the guilt of sin. Well, how do you get rid of the guilt of sin? Well, you turn away from the sin, but that alone won't do it. You've got to turn to the God who gave his son for your sins. Lord willing, in a future lesson, we're going to look at the interruption to the sermon and the continued growth despite that. But I want to close this morning by saying this. There is every reason to believe that he was raised from the dead. That he was raised and therefore there's going to be a judgment. Are we going to turn to him? Are we going to come to Him in wholehearted obedience? Truly be converted. If you've never done that, you need to today. But let me say this, it may be that there was a point in your life when that happened. But you've forgotten what it was about. You've drifted back into sin or you've drifted back into some complacency that's not living for him why don't you come back to him why don't you return today if we can help come as we stand and sing together thank you for watching this video we're glad that you have found our channel and in fact while you're here we would encourage you to subscribe to the jones road church of christ channel 
We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.